Hi everybody, welcome to Simply Scuba and welcome to Ask Mark where I answer all of your burning questions about scuba diving and such. Uh, if you do have any questions that you want me to elaborate on, uh, let me know down in the comments below and try to add the hashtag Ask Mark uh, and that way I can just filter it out and find it a little bit easier. On this week's show we are talking about adding colour to your equipment. Uh, we're talking about ponies, awesome. Um, belt knives, photochromic lenses, good long words, uh, titanium dive knives and vacuum packing your wetsuit that one's different um so let's dive straight in with the first question Drioni says hi mark talking ab about colorful gear i would like to add some color onto my black fins i tried some white permanent marker but it didn't last very long uh, what paint would you recommend for painting fins that is durable and marine safe um yeah this is a um a fairly common one where where a lot of people want to customize their fins to uh, make them stand out a little bit better in the water so that people can identify them um, and with black fins it's quite tough because everyone has black well i say everyone more and more people have colorful fins nowadays um yeah i mean i i used uh i used oh what is it called gear um it, it's like a a, a gel that you uh, a colorful gel that you apply to um, uh, to a surface it bonds to it and it's kind of 3d as well um, so you can make raised text and stuff um, that only lasted a little while um, so I never use that again because it, it just came off um, it, it's quite tough I've heard I've heard some divers use something called bright mark um, which I think is a um, uh, I can't think of the word. It's it's not like oil based, but it's uh, it, it's not it's not water soluble, obviously. And and I think that does quite well. The important thing to remember with that is to um, if especially if they're brand new fins, you kind of want to scuff them up a little bit. Get some real um, uh, sort of light, is it light grit, um, very fine sandpaper to kind of scuff up the uh, the surface a little bit so that it actually has something to bond onto but also to help remove any um, uh, release agent that they use in the manufacturing um, so give it give it a bit of a, a scuff up uh, and also that 3m uh, that scotch light tape um, the uh, that reflective tape that you see on dsmbs and things um, that reflective tape is very very good so um, and of course it's it's marine safe as well and it sticks quite well in that marine environment um so i see that fairly often um yeah you, it's, it's tricky you want something that's marine safe that that doesn't uh, react with the water but of course if it ever does fall off it, it's not going to kill anything and it also has to be flexible um with a lot of traditional paints uh, they're great uh, as long as it's a static uh, object but as soon as you add flexibility into it over time it just breaks and flakes off and then that ends up in the environment which we don't want which is why I don't really do it myself just because hey most people tend to recognize me in and out of the water so it is not really worth um, sort of putting anything else on my fins but yeah from what I've seen online with uh, sort of forums bright mark is the uh, is the one that I see most often uh, other than that some kind of tape um, even like some like heavy duty duct tape, um, I see some divers, they either cut out a letter onto it and, uh, and affix that to their fins. Um, they seem to be the, um, the most popular options. Um, and I think some divers I've, um, no, it, it wasn't a fin, it was a back plate. They were doing that, um, that dip die thing. You, you get a sheet with a pattern on it, you lay that down on like the surface of the water, spray it with something and then you dip it into it and then you have the pattern on the uh, on the actual thing. It, yeah, it must have been a back plate so I don't know if that would work for fins. Uh, if anyone does have any experience of course let us know down in the comments below. Um, but yeah, have a look at Bright Mark. Uh, I think it's B-I- B-R-I-T-E uh, Mark or um, that 3M that reflective uh, scotch light tape uh, that they use on uh, on DSMBs and life jackets and stuff because then yeah it, it reflects light as well Ken Roach says, I'm wanting to use a 19 cubic foot, uh, 2.7 litre pony bottle as the air source for my dry suit. Mounting it to my cylinder, will I need to compensate with more lead on the opposite side? If so, how much should I expect to move around? Um, 
maybe, but only really, if it's a steel cylinder, then yes, you'll probably want to compensate with by probably shifting one kilo uh, around to the other side. Uh, it's more about the, the, the negative buoyancy on that side, just to equalize it out a little bit. Uh, but with an aluminium cylinder, they tend to be fairly neutrally buoyant anyway. Uh, you can find all of the listings of them. Uh, I forget who did it. Someone basically crunched all of the numbers uh, with and without valves and stuff of all these different size and shape cylinders uh, and they just created this whopping great big table and it tells you the uh, the buoyancy of them uh, and that's very very useful to um, to yeah, be able to um, sort of work out the buoyancy um, but with a, a little a tiny little pony cylinder on the side especially an aluminium one I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's kind of one of those things where if you just literally just go on a check dive, just see how it works. Um, but I wouldn't shift too much onto the uh, onto the other side because it's not going to be too crazy. Uh, what a lot of scuba divers end up doing is mounting them. They're, they're usually the, the smaller like half litre cylinders onto the side of your back plate. That's why there are those little um, holes punched around the sides of your, um, uh, of your back plate. So you can mount it under your arm out of the way and you don't have to attach it onto the cylinder because if you ever have to switch cylinders, then you have to get the whole thing or you've got a pony clamp or something. But yeah, if you're just using a small little um, two litre, I wouldn't shift too much lead around, maybe like a kilo on the other side just to counterbalance it, um, especially if it's uh, an aluminium because they really don't have that much negative buoyancy. Um, but yeah, that, that would probably be the most. I'd move like one kilo across, see how it goes, do a check dive, and if you feel like you're tilting over, then just move it a bit more round on your, uh, your weight belt until you find yourself nice and horizontal. Kilbo Fraggins says, hi Mark, really random one, but I have a long hose setup and want something to use to hold it close to my webbing. I know you use a knife, but I'm struggling to find a small knife that is webbing mountable. Uh, have you got any recommendations? Thanks. Um, yeah, so my one is a, um, a DIR zone. Uh, I think they just called it the dive knife. They're not too imaginative with their, uh, with their names. Um, and that's just a very compact little um, serrated blade that's uh, and blunt tip as well so you're not going to damage yourself with it and that just has a, a drop down um, a webbing sheath that you can tuck the hose underneath to stop the hose from um, just flapping around um, if you can't find that i think they still make it so um just just have a look around there there are a few dive sensors that will uh, that will carry these because they're they're pretty simple and to replace the uh, the actual knife itself it's pretty simple you just get a, a serrated um, kitchen knife and just blunt off the tip uh, that's a little trick um otherwise you get trilobites um this one uh, they have three different harnesses this one i think they call this the strap harness because the the loop of the um, uh, of the webbing just is like built into the length of the actual um, sheath itself and that's more to go over like a dive computer strap so it's um, it's a bit more streamlined but they also do one that that loop drops down a bit that you can I think they do unless they've changed the design um, but they do a, a harness um, strap that you can sort of attach it to a harness and that way it drops down a little bit. This one will drop down a bit but only about two centimeters um, so it could work but it's not really um, sort of enough you want something with a good sort of inch or two to, um, to hook underneath um, or uh, yeah, or the third one, which is, I think they call it a flexi pouch, which is just Velcro. So you can Velcro it over a, um, a section of your nylon webbing. Um, failing that, uh, yeah, if you dive with a battery, um, that's where that kind of originated. You had a, a external battery mounted to your hip. Uh, that's a bit more expensive than a, um, uh, than a dive knife. Otherwise you can get a, um, I think they just call it a hose retainer bar. Um, that's if I'm not diving with my um, my dive knife. Um, it's usually in this bag. Um, and that's just a simple piece of Delrin. Um, and that's basically to replace 
your uh, your dive knife to give something to uh, to hook underneath. I think Apex still make them. They're very simple. I imagine they're very easy to uh, to manufacture. Um, but also with um, uh, with that harness, the oh I'm sorry with that um, that webbing sheath. All that really is is just an offcut of um, uh, of nylon webbing. And as long as you get fairly good with a uh, sewing machine, I can't imagine that's too complicated. They just loop it around a couple of times and, um, and that's it really. It's actually something that I'm thinking about doing with one of my other dive knives. Um, when the, um, uh, when the plastic sheath ends up breaking the, uh, or the mechanism, cause I'm not too keen on mechanisms. At least with this, there's no moving parts or anything. So it's something that you could actually make yourself. Kyle Knickerblocker asks, why don't mask manufacturers use a photoreactive glass on their masks? Seems like a good way to get a dark lens on the surface and a clearer lens in the water. Um, I imagine they've looked into it uh, and there probably will be some reason um, behind it. One, one of the usual reasons is cost. Um, as far as I'm aware, luckily I've never needed glasses or reading glasses. So um, as far as I'm aware, those uh, photochromic lenses are a bit more expensive um, and it, investing in all of that R&D and getting those lenses is gonna be a little bit expensive for, for the manufacturers on something that divers might want. Is this a, a feature that a, a, an average scuba diver would want? Um, possibly. We are seeing more and more of those lens um, treatment options out there uh, and more people are sort of starting to invest in them as opposed to just traditional lenses. So possibly we might see this in the future. Um, uh, as far as I'm aware, I, ha I do know a little bit about them. You you either get plastic lenses or, um, or glass lenses and they don't like it too much in uh, in glass because with um, uh, prescription lenses, if you get thicker lenses, then I think all of the silver ion pieces, whatever it is that they put into the actual material, that does change color. It's it, it like goes out to the edges, so um, so you get darker sections and you get this like vignette, um, which you don't really want. But with scuba diving lenses, all of ours are flat unless they are prescription. So maybe that's an option. Uh, I don't think they do too well in the cold, um, which if you're diving in tropical waters, which is where you're gonna want that kind of protection, not so much of a big deal, but maybe that's why. It might have something to do with salt water as well. Maybe the, um, the ionization or something might have something to do with the, uh, with the effect. So there's probably some reason. Uh, I don't know exactly what that reason is, um, but it's either gonna be the cost or the effect of salt water, because salt water does a number on all sorts. So, um, so this kind of thing, it could be what's causing it. Um, otherwise, don't know. Maybe it's something that we'll see in the future. Paul Tyler asks, I've got a line cutter on my shoulder and a Scuba Pro Mako titanium dive knife attached to the top of a pocket, which I can reach with either hand. Uh, the Mako sheath is spring loaded, but this is the spring titanium or steel. The last thing I want is the spring to rust out and the sheath drops my rust free knife. Uh, I really can't see do you know? Uh, now this question intrigued me uh, because I actually have one. Um, so, um, so yeah, so this is my Scuba Pro Mako titanium dive knife. Uh, this comes with me on a lot of knives, typically in a pocket, uh, just as a, a backup. And yeah, as you can see, the knife is in a pretty good condition because it's titanium, so it lasts for a long, long time. Um, the sheath, I was, I was so this is the uh, the spring loaded mechanism that he's talking about. And um, yeah, the, there is a spring on the inside. Um, so I thought, hey, let's let's find out, do a little digging now. I originally thought the spring, then they're not gonna shell out for titanium. It's just gonna be steel. And when I actually am um, starting to open up, I started to see this corrosion on the uh, on the springs. Uh, they've got this white, uh, very telltale um, corrosion of salt water. Um, so that kind of made me think, oh, yeah, it's gonna be steel. But then when you actually pop the spring out, um, ooh, if I can pop it out again, the spring, is pristine if you can see that in that camera um, there's no corrosion on it uh, whatsoever that I could see and um, and it's it, it feels lighter than it should be and also it feels warmer 
than it should be, which is a usual way of telling whether something's titanium or steel. Uh, if you touch it to your lips, obviously be careful with a dive knife, um, but uh, titanium, it's not so good at uh, like storing heat. It has a a bad thermal coefficient or a good, th I forget which way around it is, uh, but it doesn't store heat very efficiently. It's why you don't tend to use t uh, titanium regulators in very cold water. Um, but the spring, I don't know exactly because I'm not a professional metallurgist or anything or and, and I haven't taken samples from this. Um, but compared to the screws, which are pretty screwed, they are just white and crusty. Um, the spring itself, which isn't protected in any way, um, looks pretty pristine. So actually it might be titanium. Um, now Scuba Pro can confirm, uh, they'd be the best people to ask, um, whether they actually use titanium springs, which kind of makes sense because why would you have a titanium dive knife when the the parts on the, uh, on the sheath are stainless steel so they end up failing? But I don't know. Either way, keep it clean. Um, I mean, I... I try and wash this out with uh, with fresh water after uh, every dive, but because it's usually in the thigh pocket, it doesn't get washed after every single dive. It tends to get washed after the end of a trip. Um, so, I don't know, I, I think it might actually be titanium. Um, otherwise, if that ever did fail, then yeah, this is actually the knife that I'm thinking about creating a, um, a webbing sheath for. Um, it would just be as simple as making a, um, a section of, um, uh, of nylon webbing that could fit this. And, um, and then I'd put that in like a little drop down. But um, yeah, as far as I can tell, I actually think that is titanium. The next question comes from Doug Law 99 and they say, hi Mark, should you vacuum pack a wetsuit to save space in your dive bag when traveling? Uh, will it do damage to the thermal properties and the comfort or is it just the same as diving in it? After spending 300 pounds on a wetsuit, don't want to destroy it before using it. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, that's new. Um, I've never, I don't think I've ever seen someone open up one of those Ziploc bags um, to uh, to get their to get their wetsuit out of their kit bag. But also on the flip side of it, how would you um, like travel it back home? Um, it's all very well and good to the doing in your living room to uh, to make it fit into your kit bag. But then when you're in another country in the middle of nowhere, how do you get it back into your kit bag once you've unzipped it? Um, would it affect the uh, the thermal properties? Probably, um, what what it would do is create some creases, uh, especially if you fold it, um, then you're gonna create some real serious creases um, depending on how big the actual bag itself. If you manage to get a full body bag uh, that you can vacuum pack, then at least you're gonna get uh, creases down each side. So throughout your entire body, you're gonna get these two long creases that are gonna pinch all of the bubbles out of it. Um, so no, I'd probably stay away from it um, and just roll up your wetsuit as best you can so you, you're avoiding creases. Um, uh, no, I, I don't think I've ever been that pressed for, uh, for space to be able to uh, or to need to vacuum pack. Um, will it have a different, uh, a greater or less effect than actually diving with it due to um, ambient pressure? I, I don't know what a vacuum or how much of a vacuum a vacuum cleaner um, creates. Uh, I don't know what the, the tour, would it be a tour? Um, how much vacuum it creates? I, I don't actually know how much they do. We'll have to talk to Charles Dyson or whatever. Um, would that be greater than diving to like 30, 40 meters? Maybe. Uh, I, I don't know how much vacuum a vacuum cleaner creates. Uh, it's an interesting question, um, but I try and reduce um, the amount that your wetsuit endures over its lifetime. Um, that's the one downside to neoprene wetsuits is that the more you dive it, the thinner it gets over time because it's just compressing and then uncompressing, compressing. And over time, eventually it does just get thinner and thinner. So wetsuits end up getting colder and colder. Um, so by accelerating that, uh, you're kind of doing yourself out of a, um, a nice wetsuit. So I'd probably avoid it if possible. Um, 
and I don't think I've ever seen anyone else uh, use a um, one of those vacuum bags to uh, to compress their um, uh, their neoprene wetsuit down. You get it on like an industrial scale for a lot of neoprene dry suits. You will see them as like high density neoprene or compressed or crushed neoprene and that's basically it it was like an eight mil thick panel of neoprene and then they basically vacuum pack it eliminate all the bubbles and then it's it's becomes a little less buoyant it's a bit tougher um so it, it's not no, it, it's a dry suit you meant to wear it over an undersuit so as far as the comfort it's probably it's usually a bit stiffer uh, a bit less pliable and stretchy um, so yeah I, I don't think you'd be doing your wetsuit any favors and that's it for another week uh, again very interesting questions um, places I didn't think that we'd be going um, you're always great at coming up with uh, interesting questions but you if you have any interesting questions uh, by all means let me know down in the comments below and try to use the hashtag ask mark just so that I find it a little bit easier uh, in the meantime a lot of the uh, the other communities uh, they'll help you out and they'll answer you uh, in the meantime because I don't get to everyone's questions um, sort of in a week so if you do see a question down there that you already know the answer to um, do them a favor and, uh, and let them know as ever don't forget to like share and subscribe do all that social media stuff and of course head over to simplyscuba.com our website thank you for watching everybody and of course safe diving